we will just start with a few minutes quiet reflection meditation and um, so I'm going to just gong once to, to bring us into a, a more quieter state so before I do that um, just to explain short time UJ EJ sorry EJ will then bring us into an, a meditation on the divine name so it'll be just after a very short time of silence and then we immediately go into your meditation each lead us into that so maybe we could take a few deep breaths and perhaps just move from the head to the heart letting go as much as possible of all the thoughts and worries that are happening in our lives and as we go into this silence and then into EJ's meditation maybe we could just join worldwide worldwide with all the people who are entering to prayer entering into sending energy of healing and light and peace for this present uh, situation
and welcome to those who have joined us. Um, and uh, Sia, could you perhaps just shortly uh, um, give us more information about Mystic Matters and what it's all about for those who might not know? Oh, okay. Well, Mystic Matters started seven years ago with three of us who had been at Sadiba, which is an inter-spiritual center in um, Hartbis Mokdam. And three, three of us got together and said, well, not everybody can get up to Hartbis Mokdam for the meditation and silence and celebration of the Eucharist. So we had uh, been talking about mysticism. We'd had some presentations on mysticism at Sadiba. But so we came back down from the mountain, back to Pretoria, and the three of us sat together and prayed and started a little group. It took a while to find a name. In fact, I think Francis, you're in the corner. I think it was Francis who suggested Mystic Matters. I think so. Is that right, Francis? Can't hear you, but... Oh, sorry. Yes. It was Jean. It was Jean. I don't know if Jean is with us. She has got the note. I thought, it, yes, there was some discussion between you and Jean and the group, so we decided on Mystic Matters. So for seven years, we meet once a month, and we started off looking at the mystics, Christian mystics and then mystics of all the different traditions. I just want to say that, you know, um, I want to dedicate this uh, presentation to my grandmother who passed away uh, last year. Her uh, name was Isabel Morco. And she was someone who really believed in the divine name and, you know, the importance of the divine name. Uh, and somebody for me who lived up to the ideals of our creator. Um, and you know, something that really struck me in Jonathan Goldman's book, um, you know, this is a quote from the Bible where God says, this shall be my name forever. This is my appellation for all eternity. And really what I think what Jonathan Goldman is trying to do and what I'm trying to do in my own small way is to contribute to reviving the divine name and the power of the divine name, lest it be forgotten. So just very briefly, our topics for today is we will look at the divine name and how that is embedded in our DNA. And then I will uh, do a bit of a recap on uh, Trisha's talk uh, of um, about two weeks ago and how that all links up with what we are discussing today. And then I will really get down uh, in talking about the divine name and the discoveries that Jonathan Goldman made. Uh, Celia, can you still hear me? Fine? Yes, fine. Thank you. Right. So I'm going to give us all a very uh, brief crash course in the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, you know, for, for all of us that might not know, uh, the Hebrew language consists of consonants. And they didn't really use vowels um, at the time. And, you know, as we go along, you will see how that, um, you know, uh, links to what we are discussing and, you know, why that is important to know. Um, so really people, you know, for example, you know, we, would, we might have the word uh, bet, and that would be, um, you know, B-E-D. But if we only had consonants, you know, it would be the word B-D. But that could really mean bet, it could mean bat, you know, it could mean anything, uh, you know, but it's really the context, you know, that would um, determine the meaning of the word. Um, and then there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And, you know, it's quite powerful from what I've discovered is that, you know, they also assign like a numerical value. Uh, to the alphabet, and that you can really find in Greek as well, and that is called the science of gematria. And that is really saying that 
the language has got an outer obvious meaning as well as a hidden inner meaning. So just to give you an example, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet is Aleph, that is associated with the number one. The second letter, Bet, number, you know, with the number two. And so it goes on until we get to Yod, where, you know, where it basically it repeats itself and then it becomes um, 10. And so the sequence all go all the way until the last letter, Tav, which has got the value of 400. So in the next uh, screen, you will see, yeah, there we go. You will see just an example of what the Hebrew alphabet looks like and all the different values. And as we go along, you will see why that is important to note that aspect. Now, just to give you some examples of, you know, this interplay between the outer meaning and, you know, the inner meaning of words in the Hebrew alphabet. The Hebrew word for soul is neshama, uh, which is written as the vowels n, sh, m, h. And assigning the number codes described in, you know, what I've been mentioning in that uh, example, the values is, you know, becomes 395. As you can see on the screen, the value for the N is 50, for the SH 300, for the M 40, and for the H 5. So therefore, in terms of um, the meaning of, uh, the, in terms of numeric terms, uh, 395 is the value of the soul. And then it really gets very interesting because there's another Hebrew word which denotes heaven, which is Ha Shamayim. And if you count up the values, it's also 395. And I just thought I would share that with you just to show that, um, you know, there's so much going on, uh, you know, on a mystical level. Uh, you know, so, you know, that will also help us to understand how uh, the divine name is encoded in our DNA. So, as people who are interested in mysticism, we are aware of the fact that there are many names of God in the many uh, different religious traditions. So, for example, in Hinduism, we talk about Brahma, the creator, Vishnu, the protector, and Shiva, the destroyer. And with many of these different names, what we get is, it's more descriptive. It more talks about an aspect of God. But in the Hebrew and Christian tradition, there are at least two instances when God is said to have revealed him or herself quite clearly by one very personal name. And of course, I'm now talking about, uh, you know, the incident where Moses saw, you know, the burning bush. And when facing the, the burning bush, um, Moses asked who he should tell the people he has spoken to. And then we get the reply of God. Eye, asher, eye. I am that I am. Now, if we really drill down into that passage, you know, we see that God revealed God's personal name to Moses and not just an aspect of himself. You know, when he said, Eye, Asher, Eye, he was, you know, demonstrating, you know, that you can also translate it with, I will be who I will be. Um, so I'm just going to read here for us. Moses then said to God, If I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What am I to tell them? God said to Moses, I am he who is. And he said, this is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am 
has sent me to you. God further said to Moses, You are to tell the Israelites, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abram, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. And quite important to note this. This is my name for all time, and thus I'm to be invoked for all generations to come. So I just want to, you know, come to a bit of biology, and uh, as you probably know, yeah, it's about 20 years ago, they finally um, managed to decode the human genome. And as you can see on the screen below, um, there's also a code in our molecules. You know, that starts with G, A, T, C, A, A, T, and so it goes on. And that, that really speaks to certain uh, molecules. And, you know, they are known as adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And all of these make up our chromosomes. So by the way, that coat, uh, you know, is only of uh, the human chromosome one. So really the key to translating the code of DNA into a meaningful language is to then apply the discovery that converts element to letters. So really what I'm saying here is what uh, this uh, gentleman, uh, Greg Braden has done, is that he has matched the values of all these elements of our DNA to the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So for example, hydrogen becomes the Hebrew letter Yod, nitrogen becomes the letter He, oxygen becomes the letter Vav, and carbon becomes Gimel. So I know at this stage it doesn't really make a lot of sense, but just be with me, uh, all shall be revealed. So, what he did is he went back to um, even what we call um, alchemy. And what he did is that he um, translated all the different elements to our modern uh, understanding of the different elements. And so if you look at uh, the figure that I've labeled as four, we now go back to our uh, periodic table that we all came to know about, uh, you know, in high school. So in my example, what he did is he used oxygen and he used the atomic mass of oxygen, which is 15, if you don't round it up. And then what he did is if we then go to, um, the figure that I labeled, or the table that I labeled as number three, what he then did is he applied the principles of numerology. So if we look at oxygen, for example, um, what he did is he used uh, the number 15, but he broke it up. So it's one plus five gives us six. And then if you remember the um, table that I showed with the different he Hebrew alphabet and the numerical values, you will see that that corresponds with the letter Vav and its numerical value of six. So for hydrogen, you know, it's one. And then what he did is he, uh, you know, that corresponds to Yod, which is 10 in the Hebrew alphabet, but he also re reduced that number to one. With nitrogen, its atomic mass is um, 15. So what he did is one plus four is five. And that gives us a reduced number of five. And so he did the same with oxygen and carbon. Uh, you know, the atomic mass there is 12. So what he did is he, um, you know, one plus two is three, and that corresponds with chemo. So if we look at uh, figure number one, we will see that hydrogen is yod, uh, 
and nitrogen is high, oxygen is half, and carbon is chemo. Sorry, I'm just admitting one more person before I carry on. And so you will see that that pattern keeps on repeating itself uh, in the different chemical elements uh, that make up the human DNA, like thiamine, cytosine, adenine, and guanine. But I really want you to also look at figure number six. Um, and you will see that the name of God, uh, that the personal name of God is made up of the letters Yod, He, Vav, and He. And that corresponds to hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen again. But if you look at the right, we will see that there's a part of God's name that also comes up in our DNA, the Yod and the He and the Vav. However, there is a, a difference, and that is that we contain uh, the element of carbon. And this is where it gets quite interesting. At again. So if you look here, Yod Hei Vav Hei then becomes the name of God. And Yod Hei Vav Gimel becomes the name of man. So what um, Greg says is that um, the Yod Hei Pot speaks to God or eternal. So one half, one half of God's name is already encoded into our DNA, into our cells. And then if we look at the last part that speaks to uh, Vav Gimel, the meaning for that is within the body. So if we put all of this together, a literal translation uh, of our DNA brings about the following message. God eternal within the body. And, you know, so I just want to recap um, a talk that um, Bishop Patricia or Tricia as we know uh, uh, did about the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father in Aramaic. And, you know, what she shared with us is that if you look at the Lord's Prayer um, in Aramaic, the first two words is Abun Dibwashmawaya. And, you know, that is really derived from, you know, a couple of words. And the first word is Ab, uh, from Abba. And boon means ray or emanation from source or birthing. And then the U talks about the breath of spirit or wind that carries the flow. And then it's a word that you pronounce like a boon. So the N, as the breath vibrates and moves, we can feel the vibration in our lips and our noses and our faces as we keep on saying the word abun. So abun means the father or mother or source. And then also co contained in the word ab, we've got father, in abun, the birth or mother. So really the first word is mother, father. And then shem, and I want to pause here because that is for me the connection between what we've just learned about uh, the divine name, um, you know, that it's encoded in our, in our DNA. So Shem, you know, it's got different meanings. It can mean na name, light, vibration, word, radio, uh, radi radiation, and resonance. And the Aya uh, means the shining or vibration from the center, going out 
into the entire universe. So if you put all of this together, uh, you know, we can translate it as follows. O oh, Father, Mother, or Divine Parent, Source of all, your vibration, name, or light radiates throughout the cosmos. So I'm just going to play a, a short a clip of where they actually sing this. Celia also shared with us another translation from the Press of the Cosmos, uh, where it says, O Bertha, Father, Mother of the Cosmos, you create all that moves in light. O thou, the breathing life of all, creator of the shimmering sound that touches us. Okay, so in my presentation, I also have different links, which I will share as a PDF document. So I just want to reflect uh, on what uh, Trish said about the word shame and the different meanings, namely light, name, vibration, word, radiation, and resonance. So when she said that, it made me think of the divine name by Jonathan Goldman, uh, which we will look at uh, you know, just now. And he discovered that the translation of the divine name, yod hei vav into English from Hebrew is the name that rusheth through the universe or the sound that rusheth through the universe. And both versions can be found in the various texts in Kabbalah and other Western mystical tra traditions. So he says that it's speculated that this name was the sound that actually created the universe. Your Teivafe or Yahweh is said to be the secret vib vibratory code of creation. And for me, the link between what Trish taught us about the Lord's Prayer and, you know, the work of Jonathan Goldman lies in the fact that the word Shem, uh, you know, and the two meanings of the word Shem, namely vibration and resonance. So for me, with the Lord's Prayer, uh, you know, if we invoke Hashem or the divine name of God, we are saying that we want to achieve resonance between us and the Creator. We are saying, make me a resonating space for your vibrations. And then Trish also mentioned that the Aramaic word uh, for to pray, shalu, means to open oneself uh, to receive something from the Holy One, the source. And that for Jesus, prayer was not about asking for things, but rather, you know, to meditate and to, con to contemplate. And as we go along, if we look at the work of Jonathan Goldman, we will discover that the divine name is a universal sound of vibration that when properly intoned can bring us harmony and healing on a personal and planetary level. So, as with a lot of amazing discoveries in this world, it all started with the dream for Jonathan Goldman. And he says that in 1993, he attended the International Sound Colloquium in Epping. And he stated uh, at his friend's place, Sarah Benson, um, and he had this dream, and he says that he remembers the date so well, March 21, 1986. Um, 
because what happened for him, oh no, sorry, I got that wrong. Um, before this dream of 1993, um, what he did is he had this meditation that took place on March 21, 1986. And, you know, that date he remembers so well because he had been engaged in a powerful meditation. And in that meditation, he discovered that there are specific vowel sounds that resonate with the chakras. And we'll speak more about that a bit later on. And so to come back to his dream, so that night he had a dream and he says he cannot exactly remember what happened in this dream, but after he woke up, he was told to write down the system of vowels that he had developed back in the eighties and that he had to flip that around, the sequence, he had to flip that around uh, we, we normally start with the chakras from the lower chakras all the way up to the higher chakras. You had to go down um, from the higher chakras, the crown, ch uh, crown chakra, all the way down, uh, you know, to the lower chakras. And he decided to do that. And when he intoned the sounds that he used to resonate the chakras, he discovered, well, you know, that the energy was going from the top of his head all the way down to, to the bottom of his spine and then back up to and out of the top of his head. And he distinctly heard the name Yahweh in the elongated vowels that he intoned or sounded. And so he asked himself, now what was I to do with this information? And he says that, you know, initially he decided to do nothing because he was so scared of misusing the divine name of God and eventually he shared it with a couple of friends and family. They needed workshops and eventually, you know, this CD in the book that I got about 10 years ago. And he also discovered that you know, quite by chance, he was attending uh, attending a mystic fair and there was this booth where they make videos of, of people's chuck, uh, auras. And he was intoning the divine name of God. And, you know, I'll show you a video of what happened to his aura. Okay, soon. He's uh, Yeah, and it just sounds almost verbatim, like what Vivekananda describes as his experience when he had a revelation on the sound patterns and intonations on the Vedic chanting that they used to do. And, you know, since then, they've reverted to that, what was the ancient Vedic way of doing it, which was not the way they were doing it at the time. So it was just a kind of nice parallel that I saw in Golden's experience. And obviously, if you look at mystics, there's, you know, these nice parallels that they all have. But the other thing you spoke about was, you know, when you paused the first time for questions, and you said that line about um, God in the body, that just, it's so in sync with the standard Hindu view of God and the world. So we have something called the great Mahavakyas from the Vedas. There's one from each one. 
So it's kind of said to be the what's in the Vedas. So from the Rig Veda, for example, there's one that goes Am Brahmasmi, which means I am Brahman. There's one from the Atharva Veda that goes um, I am Atma Brahm, that means I am one with God. And there's one from each one, I can't remember all of them. One is um, Tatpamasi, which means I am that. So it's so nice to see that there's this, um, this parallel, you know, this commonality between different traditions. So this dualistic approach that we have in mainstream religions is really kind of misguided. It's nice to see this reversion to what it actually was meant to be. Mm. Well, thanks for that. That's my comment, thanks. Uh, you know, what he uh, also mentions in the book, which I didn't mention, is that he also talks about, you know, those different um, tonings that he uses for the chakras. And he also talks about mantras and how we can also see the divine name uh, as a mantra. Just gonna... Yeah, can I just say quickly, yeah, while sure. I'm stuck in Poland and reading this book, which is called The Second Coming of Christ. Oh, wow. A commentary on the Bible by a great saint named Paramahamsa Yogananda. Some of you might know the book. I love Yogananda. Mm. So it's a two-volume work. It's brilliant. And it's so much in sync with what you're saying. And it really just kind of um, gives a very enlightened take on on the whole um, biblical canon. So... Yeah, a bit of advertising there. Thanks. Yeah. So if you want to ask a question, uh, please feel free to uh, unmute yourself. I see Celia, you also wanted to say something. Sorry, I was um, just to let, let us uh, know, Suren, you're coming back on Zoom with uh, Yogananda <laughs> soon, coming back with the two books, having read them from cover to cover. I hope so, yes. <laughs> which I know is a task, they're so, they're, they're not, uh, it's not a short read, but if everyone agrees with this, let's follow up with Suren and Yogananda Paramahansa, Paramahansa um, because it's so pertinent. And, um, you know, coming from the Hindu background, as you do, that would be a welcome contribution. So can we get your commitment here and now? Okay, some motivation <laughs> to actually read it properly. Yeah. Okay, good. I'll also do that. I'm going to take it off my shelf now that you've mentioned it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Eugene. I just think that's a good possibility. I wanted to know, um, I've always thought of pronouncing uh, the divine name, not as Yahweh, but as Yahva. Um, so what do you think is a closer um, approximation of the sound of the divine name? Um, based on all the research that I've done, Yahweh is probably the closest, uh, mm. you know, and the name of God is also contained in the phrase Hallelujah, for example. Mm. So Yah would be the first part, yes, that's yeah, nice, Yah. Yeah. 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 Um, but Yah, we're but not... the way part... <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not quite sure where they got that, you know, it might be very close to that phrase, um, Ashere Ye, you know, mm. You know, that part where God says, I am who I am. But yes. to be honest, we are not sure. And mm. Jonathan Goldman says, you know, that there's much more power in intoning the divine name than just speaking a name. And I think uh. that is really what I'm taking away from it. That ultimately, um, for me, it's about our intention. It's about... Uh, the vibration and if we can mm. uh, connect with that vibration I think it's much more powerful than any you know name that we might use or not use can you intone it for us uh, are you with intone? <laughs> I'm not no. I'm not there yet <laughs> oh, okay. still learning and that is why I actually want um, uh, a lady uh, called oh, Devona to come and you know assist us with that team and she's really an expert on that okay thank you sure you're welcome Don. i say something yeah please. Uh, apart from intoning the divine name it was often 
breathed or breathed. So they often uh, said it, they didn't pronounce it, they said it as Yahweh, Yahweh, with a breath in each part. I just want to put that in. It's beautiful, thank you. So, Celia, anything from your side? Um, I, I wanted to echo what Barney had said. Um, perhaps it's something we can take up again later, maybe in another session, because I think it's got um, implications from the Christian tradition, the Christian mystical tradition. But now I've switched to, to the breath because of, of this discussion with you and Trish. And I guess many of you know about the um, talk that Richard Raw gave on Yahweh as the breath, as the prayer of the breath. And he gave this to a group of people. And at the end of the talk, an Islamic scholar, Muslim scholar came up to him and he was shaking. He was in tears. He said, I listened to your talk on Yahweh. And he said, but this, this is what we as Muslims, how we pray. Allah, Allah. But he said, I'm so moved by this. And he was actually shaking as he spoke to Richard War. He said, here we are with the same prayer, the same prayer of the breath. And at the same time, here we are still fighting each other. And then Richard Bohr went on to speak about giving the same talk in Hawaii. And it was the breath, the ha in one of the languages in Hawaii was breath, but at the same time it was God. So ha was God. And he didn't realize this as he was talking in Hawaii, but when he spoke about the breath and ha, everybody just started clapping because it resonated so much with, with their understanding of the breath and the divine. So all these links coming together, um, it, it's, it's actually quite amazing. I think we, it's the tip of the iceberg. Sorry, I'm going on too long. No, but, it's wonderful. But, Thank you. Um, yo, that is very rich and powerful. Thank you. Just uh, as a little anecdote, um, in our household, let me put it this way. Um, as a sister in the convent, we were not encouraged to sort of sigh because if you're sighing, you're not really accepting the present moment. They didn't put it like that. So I spent most of my life not sighing. And then um, my husband, who's just outside, so I guess he's going to hear this. He, he would sigh a lot around the house. So, ha, ah, ah. But after we heard Richard Gore's talk about the half being the breath and the sigh being the breath and the breath being God and being united to God, we used to go around saying, and, are you praying again? Instead of, are you sighing again? because it's all linked to the breath. But on a less, you know, anecdotal note, I really am fascinated by the fact that, well, Richard Poor said, we start with the one breath when we come into the world, and our whole life is prayer. And the last breath is also prayer. So that's a whole other topic of discussion. But um, it does make me seriously consider my breath much more than I used to and certainly I do sigh now much more <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah what I also wanted to mention earlier is that um, you know we've created a Facebook page for Mystic Matters so uh, if you want to join that you're quite welcome and then also a YouTube channel, if you, uh, you know, can subscribe to that and, you know, also like our videos. We already have two videos on there. Uh, one that I recently made about the different ways in which we are connected. And then also the first part of Trisha's talk on the Lord's Prayer. And in two weeks time, when she uh, will come back to do the rest we will also post that video and we will also post uh, the video of today. And, you know, I will also share the PDF, uh, you know, that 
I converted this PowerPoint to PDF. So yeah, I would like to take us in the, in the final uh, meditation and then, you know, if anyone would still like to stay behind to chat, you're more than welcome uh, to do that. Thank you, EJ. Thanks a lot.